My guest today is Patrick Sullivan. Patrick is a husband and a father of nine children. We'll be talking about his children today. And Patrick is an author and a Catholic speaker. And today we're going to talk to him about parenting. Hi, Patrick. Great to have you on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm very excited. My first question is, because I have four children, my wife and I, what's it like to have nine? <laughs> <laughs> it's the exact same as having one, only crazier. <laughs> I found that it got crazier. You know, we had two, we each had one, and we had three. And then after we had three, it's like, well, whatever God gives us, let's go for it. <laughs> And that's a great way to put it, Jeff. You know, the funny thing is, once you get to that three, four mark, really, I, I think the only big difference is it forces you to have routines in place. Mm -hmm. Honestly, that's what happens to mom and dad. We, you, you say to yourself at a certain point, if this is going to work, if we're going to do what God is calling us to do, we need to figure this out already. So that's why I'm glad I'm here today with uh, you and your guests, or sorry, you and your audience, because I think a lot of people just need to know that there's so much more we can talk about, but yeah. Okay. Here's this guy with nine kids and I need to, to get my house in order. I need to figure out what our routines are. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I know. So you have an apostolate that's called me and my house. Yes. What is me and my house? Me and my house is a, a program, a project our team put together to help parents, parents like those who are listening right now, down to earth mothers and fathers who really want to enjoy the peace and joy of family life. Mm -hmm. Because the world puts out this lie, and you've heard this as well, Jeff, that becoming a parent means losing everything that's good in life. Uh, you're going to lose your vacations, you're going to lose your free time, you're going to lose everything, you're going to lose yourself, your identity. Mm -hmm. We want to kind of reject that message because we believe we should. The Lord promised us peace. This is the same God who called us to our vocations. So we don't think that they're in opposition. We think that when we're really living out that vocation as mother and father together in unity and marriage, we actually can be more joyful, more at peace than our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And this program, Me and My House, it's a full video program and we have a whole bunch of resources, a blog. It's all meant to help you rediscover that. Mm -hmm. Where is the program available, Patrick? Well, if uh, you go to memyhouse.net, you can come across the program right there and mm -hmm. you can preview a whole bunch of videos and, and jump in, really. Mm -hmm. Great. That's a good place to start. And we'll put that in the show notes. So you talk about routines. What type of routines are you talking about? Well, I'm talking, when I say routine, I, I'm going to step back a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say really what we're trying to talk about is a culture. You know, when you go to the, the baseball stadium, you are stepping into the culture of baseball. And you know there are certain ways of speaking, certain ways of behaving. There are even rules at play, but you accept all the negative stuff, those rules, for the love of the game, right? Because we step in that culture, it's expected. And in fact, not only is it expected, you want the outcome. You want to sit there in the stands, or if you're the player, you want to play that game. It's the exact same thing in family life. When we have a culture, this we're the Sullivan culture, we're the Sullivan family, there are rules, there are ways of moving, ways of behaving and speaking that we accept, even when they're hard for our kids, you know, they'll accept them because they love what comes out of it. Mm -hmm. Again, what comes out of it is this peace and this joy, not a fear of going home where I'm going to be exhausted. You know, Jeff, people used to say to me years ago, Patrick, you're going, I feel bad for you. You're going home to, at the time, five kids. Oh, you, you're going to leave work and go home to five kids. That must be exhausting. And even years ago, I was able to say to them, no, you, you have it all wrong. I get to go home to a bunch of little feet running to the door, yelling, daddy's home. You know, giving me hugs, welcoming me, telling me the great things about their day. There was and is a peace in our home and a joy. And when you step into that kind of culture, when you create that kind of culture through your routines, through your house rules, we like to call them over it here at me and my house, things begin to change. Mm -hmm. And the things you used to fight with, with your kids over, you know, you don't know you can't do that, or you can do that, but only in part or only at certain times, they begin, even our kids, they begin not only to accept them, 
but endorse them because they too are feeling that peace and joy that we all crave. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Um, it makes a ton of sense as be being a parent. I used to love to walk in the door and, you know, not only was my dog happy to see me, but my kids were <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. happy to see me. Um, and even today, you know, when I see my grown kids or talk to them and I talk to them quite frequently, it, they're always happy to, to talk with me. And it brings joy as a parent, right? Exactly. Exactly. And now that, imagine, imagine we could duplicate that. We can show new parents. We can show parents who have kind of lost their way a little bit that you're not an exception, Jeff, and I'm not an exception. We have a different number of kids in our family, but there is a way to do this. It's supposed to be the normal path. It's supposed to be part and parcel of this vocation called marriage. So if we can do it, anyone can do it. We just have to be able to share and convey those messages, those tips and strategies that we learned along the way. It, it can be that simple. What are some key tips or strategies that you could provide the listeners? Well, simple things like I, I always encourage parents to focus on loving their kids, obviously, but I narrow it down even further. I really believe that unless parents are learning to show affection towards their children, they're going to be trying to jump far too many steps at a time. So what is affection? Affection is basically to be glad that the other is here. So basic, so simple. We can get all philosophical and theological if we want. But basically, that's what is at, that's what is at the heart, right? So the grandparent sees the grandchild and ruffles their hair or gives them the candy. What are they doing? They're expressing this gladness, this love, this affection. I'm glad that you're here. You know, the spouse walks in the door. Are they glad that they're there or not? And when we see our children, children pick up on this. Are you glad that I'm here, dad? Mom, are you glad that I'm here? And it's so easy to convey this. And I encourage mothers and, and fathers to do this. Try it today. Just glance at your kids and smile and let them catch you. You've said so much right there. You've said, no matter what I've said in the past, no matter what the world is saying about parents and their children and the strife between them, this dad is glad that his children are here. And that goes so far in building a healthy, happy, and holy relationship with your kids. So that's a big tip I always like to pass along to parents. If you're struggling with how to fix a relationship, you're struggling with discipline issues, if you're struggling with I mean, there's so many things that could be going wrong. Start here. Fix the affection. Show it. Let them just eat it up. Mm -hmm. Let them know. My dad, my mom, my, my grandparent, they're happy when I walk in the room. They light mm -hmm. up. And they should feel it. That's important that they feel it. And that smile that you talked about earlier, it's contagious, right? It is. It's so smile at you. What are you going to do? Exactly. It's so contagious. And now we've just changed how the next conflict is going to go. Really? Because it's about a math equation, quite simply. When we have a conflict with our children over the family culture, over the rules we've set in place, if we don't already have affection, we're starting at zero, right? It's, an, it's neutral ground. So there was no affection being shown. We're at zero. And then we have a conflict. And I have to step in and I have to use my stern daddy voice. I have to discipline. And my child walks away from that. And no matter how good I think I am at disciplining, they're saying, I'm in my dad's bad books. Our relationship is at a negative one. And you have enough of these, you're going to feel like you're in a hole. And it's hard for your child, wherever the stage they're at, usually I mean, up to teenagehood, they have a hard time thinking, how am I going to climb out of this? Now, if affection is at play, though, you're at a plus one. So when you have that conflict with, it will happen, Jeff. It's going to happen. I, Absolutely. I, yesterday at a conference. Especially with teenagers. Right. Oh, I, we were talking about this earlier. I have three in my house. You know, the conflicts are going to come, especially with the family culture. But when we do, now it's okay. We're at neutral ground. It's easy to get up again. It's easy to reignite that once more. And that's what we want. We want to make sure the conflicts are fewer and fewer over time. And they cause less and less damage to the family relationships. And we can do that if we focus first on affection. If we do that and make it consistent, 
then we're going to have no problem at all getting back to that culture, which we all crave. And Patrick, when they dig that hole or they get themselves in that situation where they know you're not happy for them, what's really important at that point in time? Well, it's really important to separate, you know, we talk about this as Catholics, you know, I hate the sin, but I love the sinner. Well, as parents, it's something similar. I've said to my, my teenagers before, I hate what you just did right now. Mm -hmm. I really despise what you, and I can be very stern, very serious, but in the same breath, I will say, but I love you. So I'm willing to put up with that and we need to work through that and fix that and whatever, but our relationship, that, that will never change, but that we need to fix. And I'm going to help you fill that hole and I'm going to help you get out of this. And we're going to do X, Y, and Z, but you and I, our relationship, mm -hmm. dad, daughter, dad, son, that's never going to change. I will always be there for you. And especially with teenagers, Jeff, I make them repeat it. I, I do. I say, did you hear me? Yeah, daughter. You know, they grumble, they mumble. Yeah, daddy. <laughs> Sorry, who will always be there for you? You will, dad. No matter what? No matter what. You know, they need to hear themselves say it. Because how we speak about ourselves and how we speak about our relationships changes the decisions we make in the future. It can really influence us. So when my own kids start to dig that hole, I'm right there beside them going, oh, I hate digging this hole with you. Oh, I really would rather be doing something else, but I'm your dad. So if this is how it's got to go, let's do it together. It's so important because who do we represent as fathers? Exactly. We are supposed to be their first image and impression of God the Father. We are supposed to show our kids that, you know, from the very first, from the, when they're the tiniest, my dad is powerful yet playful. And when we condescend and we pick up our children, they realize that the strength that we have could cause damage, but they know in their case, we always make the exception. Even yesterday, I was on the carpet with my, I have still a few toddlers in the house, and I just lay on the carpet and they come running, daddy's wrestling. And they know this is the time where they get to climb on the giant mm -hmm. and see everything. That's what we hope our fathers will be doing tomorrow, today, the next day. Why? Because that's kind of the gift that God has given you to them. You can do this for them and you can change how they see God. What a gift to us. Really. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. I'm going to go back to something. Um, how should the spouses show affection? Well, I mean, that could be a loaded question, Jeff. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> Between each other, it, the same principles are at play. They should always be trying to show, I'm glad that you're here. But I don't think it should mean that they never fight. I think argumentation, I think the ability to disagree respectfully, all that matters and plays out for a child and how they view the opposite sex. I think that's very important. I think it's very important also for kids to see, you know, affection between a mother and father holding hands, touch, all that kind of thing. But I also believe, and I believe this quite strongly, that mom and dad need to give the impression, more than impression, that the love that exists between them is unique and special, divinely ordained. That to get to this point, the closeness that the affection that mom and dad have, you have to walk towards that sacrament. And as they grow, you fill in the gaps. We don't lie to them, but we give them more and more detail, more and more explanation as their questions arise. Mm -hmm. I always caution parents, don't answer a question your kids are not asking. <laughs> we have to be careful about that. And sometimes we could be giving answers to things with our bodies if we're doing a little bit too much in front of them. Um, if we're letting them see too much of, on television as well, it's not always a great, <clears throat> it's not always a great explanation to simply say, oh, well, they're doing that on the show because they're married. No, even what they're watching on TV has to, as much as we can, let it reflect God's plan for marriage. So how much should that affection be in front of their kids? I think only in as much so that the kids are attracted to the vocation. We want them to see that marriage is beautiful. It's God-given. And yes, uh, this might be what God is calling you to. Maybe not, though. Maybe not. That's interesting. You talk about t television. 
because there's so much on television that is not what you and I would call a normal marriage. No. In fact, many of them aren't married. That's right. And, and more and more, the abnormal has been normalized to the point where if you watch enough shows in succession, you're going to start to believe everyone does it. Everyone believes this is normal. But that's a lie. When you talk to people one on one, do you believe that? Do you agree with that? Do you think that's OK? Nine times out of 10, Jeff, I've heard people say, no, I would never do that. No, I don't agree with that at all. But, and they'll say in the next breath, but I know most people do. No, they don't. <laughs> but because it's in the media constantly, we come to think it is. And there's the trick. There's the play of the enemy, right? Look, everybody's doing it. No, they are not. And this, by the way, is something we can use to our own benefit with our own children. When we create a family culture, when we say the Sullivans do this, when we talk about ourselves as a group, as a unit, we're basically saying when you're out there in the world and you introduce yourself, you're introducing the family. And when you introduce the family, how do you want them to think of your family? And I love seeing this with teenagers because teenagers get this right away. And many years ago, if I may, a little anecdote, many years ago when I was a much younger man, I was at a party that I definitely should not have been at. And I saw this other young man, so about 18 years old, somewhere in there. And um, he wasn't partaking in the many things none of us should have been doing. So it intrigued me. I went up to him and said, can I ask why you're not doing all these things? And he said, well, oh, it's simple. Um, basically, I take judo very seriously. I'm a competitor. And my little brother looks up to me. And I'm taking him to his first tournament tomorrow. And I, I really want to be on my game so he can see how to really go at this. Mm -hmm. And it struck me, it stuck with me. Here was a young man who could have did some pretty destroying stuff in his life that weekend. But what held him together, what, what made him go down the right path was this identity he had, this self-image, this culture, this group mentality. I belong to this family and this is who we are. Mm -hmm. And I think he would have described him and his family as we are the judo family. And because they describe themselves that way, a set of rules follow, ways of behaving follows. And I really want to encourage your listeners to think about the same thing with their own families and their own kids. Here's a little exercise I, I always encourage. Can you say to yourself and to others, we are the blank family and fill it in? Because if you can, if you can say, yeah, most of the things we strive for can be summed up that way. You have just grabbed a hold of your family culture, and now you can put it in front of your kids constantly. When you come up with a rule, why are we doing that, Dad? Because we're the blank family. For example, my family, we're a missionary family. Everything we do is about the apostolate, uh, spreading the good news, helping people to evangelize. So we can say we're a missionary family. And when my kids, now that they're older, we've been talking about this for years, when they challenge mom and dad on some decision we've made, we can say, in all honesty, looking them right in the face, well, we're doing that because we're a missionary family. And they actually say, Jeff, oh yeah, that makes sense. I forgot, that makes sense. And they'll even come to us and say, I don't think we should be doing that. And we say, why? Well, because we're a missionary family. Yeah, you make a good point. See, that's how powerful the family culture can be and how powerful it can be to have that, that group mentality. We're human beings. Sociologically, we're hardwired to be, want to be part of the group. The question is, which group? Right? I've heard someone say once, we're all conformists, really. And again, the question is, what are you going to conform to? And we know we have to conform our hearts to Christ. But that starts in the first unit of love, that first school of love, which is your family. So you are the blank family. What would that be? Jeff, does anything come to mind for you if you had to fill that word in? I have friends who they you know we're the music family. I have others who are you no, know, we're the literature family. We love reading books. We all read to each other. Uh, we get up thinking what the next novel we're going to pick up. We, we are also a missionary family. Beautiful. All, Beautiful. all my kids. One of the thing, one of the requirements of being part of the Garrett family was that you all went on a mission trip, Amazing. and we went to missions in Mexico. We went to missions in Haiti. Wow. Okay. missions across in the United States as well. Mm -hmm. But they, and some of them have, one is, I think, been on five 
her, herself, four of them, she organized herself with her college. Beautiful. Beautiful. So that is something that we did as a family and my wife and I continue to do. This is part of a mission being the podcast. Okay. That's Just like right. You have, you see how it unfolds throughout your family life. It's, it's Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about Evango. Oh, so much to say about Evango. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I used to think it was hard to describe because the Lord would have us do so many different kinds of projects surrounding evangelization, but really it came to our team. There's about four of us. Um, it came to our team a couple of years ago. Really what we do in Evango is we like to consider ourselves paratroopers for the Lord. Great uh, visual. <laughs> yeah. He, he basically says, you know what? I want you to listen for a moment. So we put our ear to the heart of the church. We talk to priests, we talk to bishops, we talk to the lay faithful. And we say, what does the church need from us at this time in history? For a week, for a month, for years, what does the church need? And our team, that's what we do. We listen. And when he makes it clear to us, we jump in both feet. We basically jump out of the plane into the mission field. And we stay for only as long as the Lord tells us to. And for the past uh, three years or so, it has been help Catholic parents, help Catholic parents. So that's one of just a few projects we're highly invested in. Why? Because we love the church. We love the Lord. And this is what he has asked us to do. And when the time comes, when the Lord says, okay, your part is done. In, now go do this. We're going to do that. So Evango is a small group of people who just are on fire. We have a passion for evangelization, but we're not stuck on what that is going to look like. We're going to jump in wherever it is, you know, <laughs> where angels wouldn't go. And we're going to do what's necessary, even if it's incredibly uncomfortable for us. And there have been times where we're thinking, really, Lord, you want us to do that? And we can say as a group, yeah, that's, that's where he's leading us. And we can look at each other and say, are we ready? No, we're not ready, but the Lord is. So let's go. Mm -hmm. That's what we do in Evango. That's awesome. How do we find Evango? Well, you can always drop by our website, evango.net, and you'll see the various things we have going on at any given time. So the website is? Evango.net. Okay, great. We'll put that in the show notes as well. What else would you like to share with the regular Catholic guys out there, Patrick? Well, you know, really what I'd like to share is not about me, but about them. Mm -hmm. I think every Catholic man on the planet needs to hear right now that they could be, if they're willing, a secret soldier for Christ. God has give them, given them a circle of grace, faces in their life that only they can reach. And as much as I would love if Jeff got in front of your family or I got in front of your family or your friends, or your colleagues, or your coworkers, whatever, the fact is you have direct access to these people. And if you're willing, you can start to turn their heart turn their heart like soil, really, so that the Holy Spirit can take off there. That is your secret mission. People don't know about it. They don't. You know Jesus Christ. You know what he's called us to do. So I want you to hear friends who are listening right now, be encouraged, be bold. Go on that secret mission because that person you're going to touch, you know, you're, you're really going to melt their hearts because you have the words, you have the way to say it. You know, who knows what they're going to do in their circle of grace in the years to come. So don't lose heart, especially now we need those secret orders and we need the people who are willing to do what the Lord is calling us to do. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Jeff. So if you want to learn more about the parenting programs that Patrick has, go to meandmyhouse.net. And again, we'll put that in the show notes. I appreciate you coming on the show, Patrick, and sharing a few stories there. God bless. God bless.